2020 Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, and we'll start with roll call on the left. Matthew Messing, Baker Harris. Jared Fortier. Sean Peterson. John Meyer. Carla Destrada. Rod Hewitt. Shivet. Yeah, we'll see that one. Brian Ray. Sonny Jack. Um, I will appoint Jared for Lindsay. Uh, moving on to public hearing A Z 2019-1620, continuation of Peter Higgins requesting a special permit for gravel excavation on property located at 1327 Norwich Road, Plainfield, Map 5, Block 4C, Lot 9, RA30 Zoning District. Good morning, or good afternoon. Edward Barnes and Mr. Higgins is here. Um, what we can report from last time is that the engineer is still working on February surveying is done. I think he has a copy of that here for you. The good news is that I think both of those individuals can have in contact with the zoning enforcement officer. So the main progress, he did have the holidays to deal with and everybody's taking vacation. But the bottom line is if you want a copy of the survey, we have that here now. Okay, so you can submit that to the office. So you do not have the plans to present for public hearing tonight. That's correct. Uh, okay. The engineer, I want to send you a disk. I have not received anything yet, so okay. I just want to hold off until the engineer and the server get me everything else. Okay. okay, so we're looking for a continuance in February. Yes, so. yeah. I just want to assure you that he's looking for a Okay, so um, they are not prepared to present at this meeting, but will be in February, so I'll entertain a motion to continue the public hearing to February. Okay, I have a motion by John. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Sean. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, public hearing schedules are continued to February. Thank you. Thank you. Item B, Z 2019-1666, continuation of Plainfield Garages and Storage, LLC, requesting a special permit for construction operation of a concrete batch plant at 91-105 Plainfield Pike Road, Plainfield, Map 17, Block 36, Lot 33, I-1 Zoning District. I have to make it a little longer for you, Norm. Get in touch with for the record, tell me what you're representing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I just think about people doing an engineering is here to go through this plant as well. And you may recall that this was, um, public hearings opened at the last time of the meeting, but we requested this little bit of tonight, um, in part to get um, comments from CME engineers or consulting engineers, which we have recently received and frankly have um, taken into account and adopted as part of our presentation tonight. One of the other issues that came up at the last public hearing was the question of, of the water capacity within the area uh, to support this particular project. We do have some exhibits to present on that, but I'd like Mr. You know, Tebow to go through his plan with you and submit to you the, the documents that he has currently, both from CME and from uh, and from Dom Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the record, I'm Norm Sebo, Killing the Engineering Associates, and I am here uh, representing uh, Plainfield Garages and Storage this evening. As you know, uh, we were here before you last month. I gave you a lot of the nuts and bolts uh, with regard uh, to the uh, to the batching plant uh, operations and, and how they, go, uh, they want to go about doing this. So um, there were a couple of outstanding items that I think came up uh, at that meeting. Uh, one of them, I think, was was uh, the question about, about water and water supply uh, and the potential uh, for you know, the possibility of uh, uh, us depleting the water table here. Uh, one of the things I can tell you is that you know, the, the watershed that actually you know, uh, this, this site rests within is nearly 4,000 acres. It's, it's, it's quite an expansive watershed. Um, well drilling uh, reports uh, for you know, the house up front, before feeling residential up front, is there's over 30 gallons a minute available there. And, uh, and uh, a recent uh, well drilled uh, for the uh, abutting property of Plainfield Materials um, was done by Dalmic. And uh, they, uh, that site yields just over 10 gallons a minute and it's 600 feet deep. Uh, the storage in the well is 900 gallons of a 10 gallon per minute pump is installed in the well. The well has the capability of discharging 600 gallons per hour 
into the on-site storage tank and into the dust control equipment. The recovery rate is 1.5 hours to replenish the storage of the well uh, in the off times. Uh, so that's, that's the, the next door property. Uh, with regard to our property, um, I, I have a second letter from Dominic uh, regarding the concrete batch plant at 105 Plainfield Clay. Uh, to whom it may concern, this is to verify that to the best of our knowledge, there is sufficient water in the aquifer that will be supplying the above mentioned project. Uh, this is based on our knowledge of wells in the area, which are true artesian and high yield wells. Uh, this is signed by Linda South, uh, our registered sanitarian, uh, and the Baldwin. I did submit a copy of that uh, uh, for the record uh, to, uh, to Ryan uh, earlier this week. Um, uh, secondly, I think it's important to note um, one, one of the things uh, with regard to wells, um, any withdrawals of less than 50,000 gallons a day uh, are not um, monitored or, or sanctioned by the state of Connecticut. Anything over 50,000 gallons a day uh, requires what's called a diversion permit. Diversions are either uh, the diversion of a stream to accept water, or taking water out of the ground, taking water out of the pond, uh, and, and, uh, or any combination of this in excess of 50,000 gallons a day. In order for this particular facility to use 50,000 gallons a day, uh, they would have to go somewhere in the realm of 90 to 95 uh, trucks of concrete a day in order to use that much water. And that's it's just not physically possible for this plant to, to produce that kind, of, uh, that kind of concrete here. So uh, we are well within uh, the parameters set forth by the, the state of Connecticut uh, and, and by virtue of the, uh, the well reports that we received from Dominic. Uh, we truly feel that uh, the, the uh, uh, drawing of water from the aquifer uh, for this particular site and for this particular activity uh, will not detrimentally affect the water table here. <clears throat> One of the other um, issues that uh, that we uh, sort of left standing last month was a review by CMB Associates. Um, we did visit the site, uh, myself uh, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Briggs, uh, and uh, representatives from CME Associates uh, we toured the site, um, took a couple of, uh, noted a couple of areas uh, that uh, that need to be addressed uh, specifically. Um, uh, one of the things that's a little bit different on the plan here than, than what was presented last month, uh, on the eastern part of the site, uh, there is the intention to keep the concrete trucks uh, separate from uh, the other uh, traffic on the property. So you can see that dedicated road uh, to the, I'm just going to point it out, which, which is right here. And that, that's a dedicated road just for the concrete trucks. And the, the intention of that is to keep any kind of concrete truck traffic uh, away from the uh, garages and storage building. Uh, there are several businesses in there. Uh, people use it for storage. Uh, and uh, there's a, a car repair facility, a couple of other smaller businesses. In order to keep those uh, segregated and to uh, avoid any kind of conflicts of traffic uh, that road is being developed. Uh, one of the other things uh, that uh, we're showing on the plans is uh, the, the, the drainage system has been slightly increased. Uh, we've incorporated uh, the runoff uh, from the eastern slopes uh, into the <coughs> drainage system. Uh, previously a lot of it was kind of uh, just um, uh, flowing, sheet flowing to the west across the driveway. Um, it was, uh, especially in the, in the winter weather, as the weather got colder, we found that uh, that uh, could be problematic at times when you've had these intermittent um, periods of melting and, and, uh, and freezing and melting and freezing. Uh, so in order to uh, help alleviate that issue, uh, that, that water uh, that might be associated coming off that embankment there uh, is going to be um, uh, conveyed uh, to the stormwater basin as well. So um, as late as 5.30 today, I was uh, still uh, uh, conversing with CME Associates. Um, one of the things uh, that they wanted, as, as a result of incorporating this additional drainage into the basin, the emergency spillway um, functions uh, for a 100-year storm uh, and results in a slight increase in drainage. So um, one of the things that uh, CME is, is uh, requesting, uh, hopefully as a condition of approval on your part, uh, that we slightly enlarge the basin uh, in order to accommodate for that. That really will not uh, take uh, too much more uh, adjustment in order to do that. I mean, we're talking 
less than one CFS increase for a 100-year storm. So it's, it's relatively minor in the big scheme of things here. Uh, secondly, uh, the, uh, one of the things would be uh, the, the MS4 requirements for the town in order to, <clears throat> to verify that we're not uh, illicitly discharging um, anything but you know, storm water and groundwater on this site. Uh, we, have to, we have to certify to that, uh, to this commission, to the, to the town of Plainfield. Uh, so um, I've got a letter uh, um, actually addressed to Mr. Braves uh, on behalf of Plainfield Garages and Storage LLC. This letter is prepared to certify that Killing the Engineering Associates is not aware of any illicit discharges from the subject property. In accordance with Connecticut DEP general permit for the discharge of stormwater from small municipal separate storm sewer systems, illicit discharge means any unpermitted discharge to waters of the state that does not consist entirely of stormwater or uncontaminated groundwater. So in other words, if they had um, floor drains or um, if there was uh, you know, some sort of outdoor activities where they were maintaining vehicles and things of that nature, uh, those would actually be considered an illicit discharge. And those types of activities aren't happening on this site. Uh, so the discharges on this site consist entirely of uncontaminated groundwater or treated stormwater. So I'd like to uh, hand that in for the record. Um, and finally, uh, CME Associates, uh, uh, with, the, with the final plans, uh, the final uh, plans when they are completed, uh, they, we must provide a stamp and sign plans and calculations uh, for the record uh, for the town of uh, Plainfield, which uh, yeah, I think is, is rather customary. We do that pretty much every time. Okay, thank you. This is a public hearing, so if there's anyone in the audience who has a comment or question regarding this application, Step up to the microphone, state your name and your comment or question. Okay. Hello, my name is Mark Mado. I'm from Shepherd Hill Road, Central Village. Okay. Um, I was the one that brought up about the water. And I'm pleased that you followed through and put some of some, uh, some my problems. So thank you very much for that. Um, big problem on that one was my mother is three houses down. It is a property that I may end up getting eventually. Um, so be it. But um, I have an absolute interest in protecting that property. Of course. So, second, a list of discharge. So now we're back to the cleaning out of the trucks. And I, I have that on the plans, and I forgot to, to discuss that. If you want to, take, please do. Because then we'll make you come in. I might have you use Sure. So, um, in this area here, uh, next to the proposed uh, the gravel storage bins, uh, we, are, we have um, shown the construction of a, uh, of a concrete washout area. And what this is, it's a, um, it's a kind of crushed out surface that the, that the trucks back up on. Uh, there's, a, there's a three foot deep depression uh, on the back side of it. Everything is sloped back toward that depression. And uh, the, as the trucks, uh, toward the end of the day, when they wash off, and pull off, they pull up on the stone, uh, they wash the trucks off, and, uh, and the water um, and, and any kind of sediment associated with the concrete uh, settles into this basin. Uh, we actually have a, an installation instruction and we have maintenance re um, uh, requirements on it as well. So as, you know, as it fills, obviously if it fills with water, um, it has to be pumped out and disposed of accordingly. Um, once the, uh, the bottom of the basin uh, collects, uh, enough uh, concrete in that uh, it's no longer functioning, that's going to be cleaned out as well, it's going to be disposed of. So is everything following with the storm water protection? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. This, uh, this particular detail is, is specifically as, as recommended by the Connecticut Utility. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Chairman, Commission members. Uh, in favor of this application, please, 2019, 16, 66, and 16, 81. Probably won't be here for the full hearing 16, 81, so I wanted to add that. Uh, Could you just state your off, name again? State your name for the record. Shall we? Course of 295 State Metal Road. First thing I'd like to say is that the applicant has been a very successful mm -hmm. businessman. Uh, he's completed many successful projects. Additionally, he's applied 
tremendous amount of housing for residents and non-residents alike. The second thing that I think is very important is the economic part of this project. The project will probably, I'm estimating, probably add two to four million dollars to the town plenty. Now, that certainly would help, I think, put my taxes a little lower. So I'm very much in favor of that. Finally, the, the project is situated, I think, in a very ideal place, in such that we have a major highway running uh, north and south to 352. We have 14A running east and west. We have Route 12 running north and south. If these roads are all state maintained, they're not going to cost the town any money. And with a project like this, he is situated in an area that's close to all of these, which means that, in effect, that truck traffic will not bother too many people. And I know that that's always a concern of everyone uh, of it. And I think it's, it's an ideal location. So I would urge the members, commission members, to vote in favor of these two projects. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Public hearing is still open for any other comments. Good evening, uh, Madam Chairman and members of the board. I spoke in December in favor of the application. Good evening. And uh, my name is Paul Sweet, 260 New Road. I'm sorry, I think I get that down by now. Anyway, bottom line is I still support the application. Now, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the audience? Jamie Clark, 107 Plainfield Pikes. Um, I'm like right in the middle of it. Plainfield Terrace is over here, and the cement plant's over here. I have no problems with it. It's I have no concerns. They're very polite, the truck drivers. I mean, it's a great, and I'm in favor for this. <coughs> John Von Deck, 114 Plainfield Pike. I live right across the street. I've been there for 15 years and I have no problem with anything that to do with on either side. I support it. Thank you. I'm um, uh, Robert Jackson. One question I have. Uh, Sir, can we just keep your address, please? Uh, 154 Dow Road. I'd love to know about all your school options. You can always see the rock crushing center cost, the medics that create the cost. Well, the, the rock crushing is not the is not the subject of this particular well, it's both on the ball. That will be coming up later. Um, there's a kind of a semi-plant in the industrial park that they were making with. And when that was running, it was on guard. So I think we better think about the noise and have that checked out. Thank you very much. Anyone else from the audience? Comment or question on this application? Okay, comments or questions from staff? Can I have one more, I have one more thing? Sure. Uh, with, with regard to this particular, this particular operation, uh, with regard to noise, uh, the, the batch plant itself is, is indoors. This is, a, this is a covered facility. So, um, you know, I would uh, submit for the record that the, the truck traffic on, on Route 14A is, is, is probably going to be much more problematic what happens at the concrete plant, plant, which is much further removed from the new Any other comments from the audience? Okay, comments from staff? Uh, all my comments have been answered. So uh, we're all set. I do have petitions for approval for deliberation during the regular meeting. Any comments or questions from board members? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion on the public hearing. So I have a motion to close by John, 
Um, second by Roz. All those in favor of closing the public hearing? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, public hearing is closed. Moving on to item C. Z 2019-1670 of Sammy T. Inc. requesting a special permit for earth products excavation and processing on property located on Millbrook Road, Plainfield, Map 10, Block 17, Lot 5, Industrial 1 Zoning District. Good evening for the record. John Felicia Boundaries LLC, also the design engineer at Dave McKay is with me as well. As the applicant, Sammy, is also here. Uh, the plans that I'm going to distribute to you are the same plans that are filed with the application, um, but I brought reduced sets so that you could each have something in your hand to look at.
property is located, uh, I'm going to speak loudly away from here, if that's okay. Um, the property is located on the north side of Millbrook Road to the west of the railroad tracks adjacent to the Plainfield Renewable Energy Facility. Um, the locus is shown on sheet one of the plan set. Sheet two of the plan set is the existing condition survey, which is a boundary survey of the area that we're going to be working, along with the wetland delineation, required municipal setbacks for the wetland regulated areas, for equipment setbacks for the operations equipment during the excavation, as well as a 50 foot excavation setback, which is identified from property lines adjacent to the area that we're going to be working. Sheet three is where we're going to spend most of our time. The proposed excavation takes place over approximately 17.6 acres of a 56 acre site. The excavation is proposed in the easterly portion of that site, again adjacent to the railway and um, just to the west of the Plainfield Renewable Energy Facility. The access to the site is from Millbrook Road over an existing paved driveway in this area. That paved driveway is 26 feet wide. It's approximately 640 feet long to where it terminates in an area of historic excavation um, at the very front part of the site, which will be part of our phase one excavation. We've identified the excavation phases in a clockwise manner from phase one, two, three, and then four adjacent to the railroad. Um, the total volume of material to be excavated throughout the project is 530,000 cubic yards. That will be done in four phases, each less than five acres. The first phase will be 111,000 square uh, cubic yards. <coughs> phase two is about 180,000 cubic yards. Phase three is approximately 95,000 cubic yards. And finally, phase four is 145,000 cubic yards. And again, that will be done in the four phases that are identified on the sheet that are outlined in green. In terms of the operations, at the entrance, we propose an anti-tracking pad. Uh, spaces for up to 10 employee parking and strip cars, a temporary scale, and a temporary processing area. Each of the phases also includes the appropriate sediment traps identified in the southwesterly part of phase one, again, southwesterly part of phase two. There are two proposed sediment traps in the northerly part of phase three. <coughs> one of those will be future, in the future converted to a permanent trap, uh, permanent basin once the excavation is completed. And then finally, the fourth set of trap in the uh, southeast corner of phase four. To the actual phasing of the site, or phasing the areas. Sheet four is the first part of phase one, which identifies the entrance location and the proposed set of traps in greater detail, along with those features that I just mentioned in terms of parking. It also includes a concrete fueling pad and a lay down area or processing area adjacent to that entrance. Sheet five, we show parts of the initial part of phase one, and then we expand into the other phases of the site. All of the slopes uh, on the perimeter of the site are designed to be at three to one uh, upon their completion. We've established a floor of the excavation that maintains, I'm just gonna go back to sheet three, We designed the floor of the excavation to maintain the existing hydrology. There's a ridge in approximately the north, third, the north third part of the property that runs east and west in this area. So we have designed the floor of the elevation, the floor of the excavation to maintain those same drain drainage patterns. <coughs> the floor from that point to the south is at half a percent back towards that separate southern trap of phase one. And from that point to the north is approximately 2% back to the total of the proposal. And burn up the air. So, as I mentioned earlier, we have three to one slopes that wrap the whole site. There is a burn that will be maintained um, between the excavated area and the unexcavated portions of the site. That burn range is approximately 20 feet high on the westerly edge to approximately 10 feet on the northwesterly portion, and then it drops down to a grade or just about a couple of feet on the northerly portion near Southern Trap Creek Head. That three to one slope is also maintained in the berm um, as well along the easterly boundary line adjacent to the rail bed to maintain a 50 foot separation distance of the rail bed from the, from the property line. As I mentioned, the floor of the pit is sloped in those two directions. 
Um, the high point of the floor of that pit is at elevation 162 approximately, and then it comes back down. We're at elevation 160 in this area, um, which is fairly consistent down as you come into the existing entrance drive um, where the entrance traffic pad is proposed to be installed. In terms of the groundwater, uh, you'll see in the top left corner, sheet three, is a groundwater monitoring table. We've installed those four wells I had mentioned. They are uh, located in the southwestern portion of phase one, the mid northerly section of phase two, the southerly section of phase three, um, and then again, right in the center of the middle of the site, essentially right in the middle of the site. Those monitoring walls are installed at depths that exceed our excavation in most cases. And the one well that I will draw your attention to is test pit four. That's the one that's located directly adjacent to the entrance at phase one. That area, as I mentioned before, I've been previously estimated, the ground elevation, the existing ground elevation in that area is 158.7. We've been able to maintain the water um, monitoring throughout the winter months. And we have established that that water elevation is at approximately elevation 145 to 146, and it's maintained that consistently. That elevation is consistent with the elevations of the wetlands located to the north of the site and to the south of the excavation area. Um, and so we have a demonstration, I'll show you some cross sections on another sheet, which identify where that water will actually fall. Five of the plan set. There are some cross sections that are identified. <coughs> Section A runs north and south, essentially through the mid part of the excavation. Section B runs east and west. And then Section C is slightly off the pages on the other sheet, and that's up in phase two and three of the excavation. When we look at the section details, Beginning on page seven, with section A that I mentioned runs north to south, you'll see the existing grade, which is this irregular line at the top of the page. And keep in mind this is an exaggerated scale. Um, you have the floor elevation of the proposed excavation here with the slight berm near the temporary center basin in phase one on the left hand side of the page, and then a little bit sharper berm as we get down near the area that I mentioned that. September Center of Basin 3A is located. That's the area of a little bit shorter burn. Um, this is the area that we're looking at an elevation of the floor at approximately 162. Back down to about 160 near the entrance. And based on the groundwater monitoring that we have conducted and the limits of the elevation, uh, the limits of the inner wetlands, um, we've established that groundwater to be down here at about elevation 145, 146. And again, our floor is up in the 160 to 162 range. So we're maintaining approximately 15 feet from the bottom of our excavation to the water table. Um, that's intentionally done so that we render the site useful as a few, for future reuse for manufacturing opportunities that may arise. The property is zoned in I-1, and we don't want to preclude um, our ability to do that in the future. Section B, as I mentioned, runs east and west, and again, you can see the steeper burns on both sides of that. We're in areas of, that are deeper cuts as we get to that 50-foot excavation setback in the property line. And again, the water table has been established based on our monitoring. The installation of those wells is shown in this section as well, and it's down here, again, approximately elevation 145, 146. So that 15-foot separation is maintained throughout. And then finally, section C which demonstrates the same information essentially on both the left and right hand side of that page. You see the elevation of the limits of the inner wetlands at elevation approximately 145, 146, consistent with the water table that we've observed. And again, the floor of our excavation um, well above that approximately by 15 feet. The remainder of the sheet sets uh, include construction details for the Burn for road control measures for the traffic bound gravel shuttle <coughs> drive, uh, for our concrete fueling pad, um, KBL check dams, 
all of those details are found on sheet 10, along with the project narrative, construction sequence, and operation maintenance of erosion controls. Um, the narrative discusses the excavation in the four phases that we've talked about. It also refers to the equipment that will be used on site that's identified in um, the third paragraph at the bottom. Um, we will be utilizing a portable screen, a portable crusher, front end loaders, excavators, uh, and, and triaxle dump trucks throughout the operation. Um, we have also identified that the, those pieces of equipment will not be stored within the 100 foot setback that's identified in the earlier sheets um, in accordance with the regulations. The maintenance, operation maintenance of road control is shown on this sheet as well. The six or seven paragraph down is probably the paragraph that's of most important to you. It requires that the erosion control measures be inspected every seven days during operations or within 24 hours of a storm event that creates a discharge from either of the sediment basins during the operation. Um, and that those inspections are continued for three consecutive months once the site has been reclaimed and loaned and seeded to ensure that there's no additional erosion after that time frame. Again, sheet 11 is more construction details version of the temporary center basins to permanent stormwater basins or basins in 3A as I mentioned earlier. And then lastly, sheet 12 includes the truck routing plant. This is the bulk of the entirety of the site, again from the railroad to the adjacent uh, east side. The truck routing will leave the existing access route, which is located in the southeast corner of the site. And following well, Millbrook Road obviously was, in, was designed as an industrial road um, to handle the appropriate uh, levels of traffic that are proposed uh, for this as well as future commercial or industrial development along Millbrook Road. With that, I will uh, ask the Commission if you have any questions. I know I kind of preached this very briefly. Uh, all of the information that you're reviewing now, as well as the documentation supporting Stormwater calculations and sizing of sediment basins has been reviewed by the county consulting engineer. Um, and as I mentioned, they received dated January 13th their um, correspondence that all their conditions or concerns have been addressed. So this is a public hearing. If there's anyone in the audience with a comment or question regarding this application, please step up to the microphone with your name and your comment. Good evening again, Madam Chairman. Paul Sweet, 260 New Road. I support the application and present it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the audience, a comment or a question? <coughs> okay, any comments from staff? Um, all the comments have been addressed. I do have one question, though. Um, the importing of material that you have, is that something to make marketable product using what you already have there in case you need to mix something with it? It would be. It would be to supplement the materials that we have on site. It may also be from adjacent sites or sites within the area. Um, like I mentioned, we will have a portable scale, uh, portable product <coughs> and uh, screening plant here, processing plant. And so the ability to bring material in if it becomes necessary um, is something that we wanted to include in the application. It is allowed in the I-1 zone, and, um, and therefore we didn't want to take that opportunity away or have to be in a position that we would have to come back and ask for something later. Any comments from board members? Hours of operation. With hours noted. Hours of operation identified on um, sheet in the narrative, and they are consistent with your regulation 7 to 7, Monday through Saturday. No holidays and no Sundays. Motion to close by Sean. Second. 
Second by John. All those in favor of closing the public hearing say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, public hearing is closed. Moving on to item D. D 2019 1673 of Benjamin and Kelly Burdick requesting a special permit for an accessory apartment on property located at 16 Main Street, Central Village, Map 1CB, Block 85, Block 33, C2 Zoning District. Uh, good evening, I'm Ben Burdick. Formally, uh, it's 217 Black Hill. It has 20 years, which we just sold. Uh, Three years ago, my wife and I purchased the old Martell Woodworking Building to uh, run my horticultural sales business out of. <coughs> and uh, our plan was to, uh, as our kids have left the house, we are not in need of the house we were in, so we just wanted to downsize and build a smaller uh, two bedrooms over the concept type of part on the second floor. There won't be any changes to the outside of this. Outside of the building, besides uh, new more energy efficient windows and a porch roof. Other than that, it's already hooked up to uh, city sewer. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure what other. I've submitted uh, all the plans to Ryan. Sent out all my. Sent out a lot of uh, uh, <coughs> notifications. All been returned and returned uh, last week. Ryan, did you review the floor plan of the apartment? I did, it applies to regulations. Okay. And is there anyone in the audience? This is a public hearing, so if you have a comment or question on this application, you know the, the rules by now. Madam Chair, Paul Sweet, 260 New Road. I support the application as presented. Thank you. <laughs> anyone else with a comment or question on this application? Board members, comments or questions on this application? Okay, hearing, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Uh, motion by Ross. Second. Second by Sean. All those in favor of closing the public hearing? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, see you in old business. Uh, moving on to item E, Z 2019-1674 of Whitney Easton, requesting a special permit for an accessory apartment on property located at 135 School Street, Central Village, Map 1CB, Block 86, Lot 21, C2 Zoning District. Hello, uh, my name is Whitney Easton, uh, at the 87 Main Street. Um, I'm just coming here before you tonight to uh, request a permit for uh, an accessory apartment for a commercial space that used to be uh, in the building. Um, I've owned the building now for about three and a half, almost four years. Um, I've been trying to rent out the commercial space. It's, um, the building is right at Route 12 and 14 split in Central Village across from Gandos. Um, um, and I had a really hard time renting out the um, commercial space. I tried for a few years. I had somebody at first who wanted to do a bakery in there and that uh, kind of fell apart. She couldn't get any funding. Um, and one of the problems people had was um, with that main street right there going so fast and no um, place to park directly in front of the uh, building, people didn't think that customers would want to drive around back to where the parking is. Um, so I requested about six months ago in July to convert it to an accessory apartment. Um, and that was approved by the, I'm still not sure exactly how the process works, but that was approved by uh, another board in July. Um, and so I came to get the building permit to start work on it. Um, and so now I'm applying for this uh, permit to be the zoning department. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, I had a hard time um, renting it, so I decided that the best use for it would be for as an accessory apartment. Um, it's going to be probably a one bedroom, um, <coughs> apartment, two bedroom, sorry, apartment. Um, not very big, it's just basically uh, what's left of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the building, what hasn't been rented out. Three other apartments in the building. And I have a floor plan here. Yes, if you can please go back. This is. Um, if you just speak a little bit louder, yeah. Sorry. Uh, actually, I know what you're going to do. That's one of the passages. Okay.
So um, yeah, so this um, would basically, there's three other apartments in the building, uh, and this would just be the, uh, the last uh, space, uh, the former commercial space. Uh, but prior to that, I don't think it's been successfully rented out for a few decades now. It was uh, a woman had a, uh, the woman who owned it had a junk shop in there. Um, so she didn't really have to, she owned the building, so she didn't really have to make much money off of it. So um, it's never been rented, it hasn't been rented to a tenant uh, for a long time. So that's why I thought that the um, apartment would be the best use for the space. Can you tell me where the street is? Sure. Um, had was um, you have to go to uh, Water Street and take a left to go down uh, and then Arneo's, by Arneo's um, uh, welding there's an entrance that's a right of way to the building. So for a tenant it's fine, you just have to tell them once, but for customers it was kind of hard to explain to each customer how to you know, get around back to park. Um, and then there's also a lot that came with the building that was needed with the building um, that's on this map here. I'll show I get some products of this as well. Um, this is the actual parking behind the building here, um, this area, and then this is the lot that came needed with the building. Um, that's also... So how many parking spots are behind? Uh, right now there's uh, six uh, apartment, uh, sorry, parking spaces behind the building. Um, and then this uh, is, I never really counted how many here, there's only ever one car there. But there could probably be four or five parking spaces okay. there uh, in that spot. So there's a possibility of ten parking spots total. <laughs> yeah, that's um, and well, I um, I spoke with somebody at um, oh, so this is sorry, this is the uh, that 23 is the lot that they um, and 21 is my building, and that's uh, so it's on the deed of the building. I'm going to show you. <laughs>
So it's basically complies with regulations now, providing the parking space. Yeah. 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 It's up to the board. If the board wants to take the applicant's statement of parking, um, then it could be closed. If they want to uh, wait for staff to review the parking to determine that it meets the number, um, then it would have to be continued to February. We are six in the back of the building currently? Correct. Six current <coughs> parking spots behind the building. I have a picture. I was trying to print it out and I couldn't get my printer to print it very well, but I have a printer of how, how the parking is laid out. And that's uh, just something about so There's one, two, three, four, five, six right there. And there's actually more space, but uh, so it's, it's they're kind of parked at. Um, so it's not lined. So yeah, it's not lined. And I'd like to get it paved. Um, I'm just I'm sort of waiting on. Uh, this to be the final. Once the, the, that this last space is finished, I can re uh, mortgage the, the building, get a little bit of money out, and then to pay both of those parking lots. Um, given the fact that it's been pending for so long, and it seems like a conversation with Ryan will resolve this to everybody's satisfaction, I make a motion that we continue it so you can talk with Ryan come up with a good parking plan. Okay. I think that would, that, that would be reasonable. Okay, so we have a motion by John to continue to February. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second by Jared. All those in favor of continuing, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, public hearings continue to February to finalize the parking. Um, sorry, does that mean the second part of this one I can went up again? Will that, do I still do that, or? You just have to talk about parking the next time you come up. I mean, that, and then the next part of this today's- You're all set for all set for today. Yes. The debate started, I want to make sure. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> all, right, all we'll say is it was continued. Okay, all right, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. All right, and item F, Z, 2019-1681 of Plainfield Materials, LLC, requesting a special permit for gravel screening, processing, and crushing on property located at 113 Plainfield Pike Plainfield, Map 17, Block 36, Lot 68 and 68A, Industrial One Zoning District. Good evening, and for the record, I'm going to read Ms. Corey representing the applicant, and I'm going to ask you all to share the 36 in order to run the first place. This application is essentially a request to revise an existing special permit that was issued in. September of 2018 uh, for a screening on this site of uh, earth product material. At that time, and, and your minutes reflect this, uh, there was a representation made by the uh, at that time that crushing would not be required at the site uh, upon operation of this over a period of time. The applicant has determined that in order to create the appropriate amount of aggregate that they need to get on site, that in addition to screening and other processing, this pressure will be necessary to be, to be done on the site, so we're back before you to, in effect, revise the permit for that purpose. Um, Marquibo of Killing Engineering is here to talk about what I think is probably going to be one of the questions that, uh, that are going to be in front of you with, with respect to noise, and uh, Norman, if you could, uh, first of all, give them the, the notices that you have. I, they, uh, I do have a, a copy of notices. Uh, they were actually scanned and emailed to uh, to Ryan, and um, I have not been in town to give them to him. So he's seen copies of them before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the record, uh, Norm Tebow, Killingly Engineering Associates. Uh, as Mr. McCoy has uh, stated, um, uh, this. Uh, this application is uh, essentially a modification of the existing application. Uh, this was uh, approved back in September of 2018 by this commission uh, for uh, screening and processing. Uh, the operation uh, has been um, in effect uh, since uh, September of 2018. Uh, uh, the improvements uh, that were uh, required as part of the application with uh, the stormwater controls and the landscaping and, uh, and, and screening and so forth uh, have been essentially uh, installed at this time. And uh, uh, in addition to the um, screening and processing, we are here now to request uh, the crushing 
as uh, Mr. McCoy has, uh, has indicated to you. Um, what, um, you know, what, what they're finding, <coughs> what, uh, what the operators are finding, are finding that uh, a lot of the material that they come across because they do projects uh, in other areas and so forth, and uh, there's, there's a substantial amount of rock uh, that they encounter that, that needs to be processed, which you know, merely screening doesn't, doesn't uh, handle. So uh, they're uh, looking to um, do the crushing on this site. Now, uh, they had a, a crushing machine set up, and uh, they were operating, uh, and uh, it was brought to their attention that they were not permitted for that. Uh, there was a, a misunderstanding about that, and they, they immediately stopped when they were told uh, that they could not do that any longer. So uh, we're back here before you. Uh, the only time since their um, uh, stopping of all activities for crushing that is actually run uh, was on January 3rd, uh, where they uh, informed uh, town staff that they would be operating the crusher for about an hour so that we could take some sound level readings uh, to, to see if uh, we could meet uh, the, uh, the requirements in accordance uh, with the, the uh, state statute. Now, um, sound levels are governed uh, by the Connecticut uh, DEP, uh, specifically Title 22A, Part 69, Control of Noise. Um, if um, many municipalities have their own uh, noise ordinance put into place, but uh, the town of Plainfield does not. So, uh, in, in this particular instance, since we do not have the sound ordinance, we, we revert back to um, uh, this section 22A. So the, um, since this is an industrial zone, the, uh, the rock crushing operation uh, in an industrial zone, it is uh, known as a, as a class C emitter. And a class C is for an industrial uh, property. So uh, for a class C emitter, uh, essentially at the property line of this, of, uh, of this uh, uh, type of use, the decibel levels are not to exceed 70 decibels. Uh, that's, well, that is if the abutting property is also an industrial zone property, which it is. As, as you have different uses, if, if the abutting property, for instance, was a residential property, uh, you'd have to go down to 61 decibels at the property line uh, during the day, 51 at night. So, um, what we did is uh, we had the, uh, the machine run uh, for approximately 45 minutes on January 3rd. Uh, the weather that day was um, uh, rather cool. It was about uh, 39, 30, 39 to 40 degrees uh, and uh, very clear and crisp. And I think that's important because uh, typically uh, the sound levels do travel uh, a, little, a little bit further and, uh, and they, they emanate a little bit louder when you've got dry conditions. If you've got hot, humid conditions, these, these levels are typically depressed a little bit. So I feel as though we took these, uh, these sound level readings at, um, at a, uh, the optimum time in order to find out what we're really uh, uh, dealing with here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab this microphone um, because as I'm looking at my chart here, uh, the, uh, uh, what I have is a common decibel level chart here. Um, and the, the darkest blue on the bottom, uh, 40 decibels is a raindrop or a quiet room. Uh, typical conversation, if, we're, if I were standing here talking to you without a microphone, is anywhere from the 60 to 65 decibel uh, level. Uh, okay, okay. No, that's right. Exactly. And uh, uh, then you've got things like an alarm clock, which is 75, highway traffic set on 85, a lawnmower uh, or a hair dryer, 90, a rock concert up to 105, chainsaw uh, or airport 110. Um, I, I found this kind of interesting that uh, uh, at 115 decibels is an iPod playing a pee pine or a baby crying, uh, which is also the start of discomfort level uh, when, you, when you start talking about pressure. <coughs> um, a jackhammer is about 120 or a car horn about three feet away from you. Uh, and then things like uh, fireworks, a gunshot, a plane takeoff, and those approach like the 140 decibel level. Um, what we, we, we took um, a, a, lot of, a lot of readings uh, starting right at the crusher all the way to this property line. Um, at the crusher itself, we were about 95 decibels, 25 feet further, 93, uh, 91, and 88 at the property line with uh, Plainfield, Plainfield garages and storage. As we proceeded to the north, uh, we had about uh, 89 uh, at the bins. Uh, 
where, it, where the uh, crushed stone falls into, 87 a little further, and at the scale around 82. As you proceed down the driveway, as you turn into the site, we were 76. Um, at the gate uh, to, the, uh, to the facility, we were at 71. At the road, uh, it's 72. With, uh, with the background noise, but every time a truck went by or a car went by, it spiked up to about 88. Um, and then at the property line, which I think were the important uh, spots, we had two readings at the property line of 66 decibels. And we are, um, by, uh, by the statute, we are not supposed to exceed that, that 70 decibel level uh, during the day. And it actually drops at night, it actually goes down to, um, let me see, at nighttime, 66. So, even though we meet the, the nighttime criteria, uh, there's not going to be any kind of crushing or processing at night. So um, we'll, we'll follow up within that. I think the bottom line is um, the, the actual sound levels at the road are, are higher uh, than at the property line. It <coughs> kind of has to do with the fact that, you, that the, the terrain drops off a little bit over here. Uh, and then you've got some, uh, some berms, some stockpiles here that kind of gets the sound a little bit. Uh, but as you get to the road, You've got this, this kind of this open shot, uh, you know, that comes right down the driveway. There's a lot of hard surface over here, and I think it, it really sort of reflects the sound a little bit better, so that you. Uh, you Did you submit a copy of that report for the record? I did. Yes. Can I get a copy of that too? I live right across the street. Sure. Um, you can get a copy tomorrow. Yeah. And you can get a copy from the town hall. Yeah. Absolutely. <coughs> That's why I was making sure it was part of. Yeah, so um, essentially, you know, um, the sound interference or, or, or damaging sounds are measured by two things. Obviously, there's, there's decimal level, it's also duration of sound, too. So, um, if uh, levels emitted in excess uh, uh, value, so uh, basically, in, in the uh, noise induced hearing damage is related to the duration and volume of exposure. Um, research suggests that a safe exposure limit is 85 decibels for 80 for eight hours a day. Now, anything above that, you really should at any longer duration or any louder decibel levels, which which occur at the crusher itself. Um, there should be a, a hearing protection should be provided at that point. Okay. So this is a public hearing. So if there's anyone in the audience with a comment or question, if you could come up to the microphone with your name and address. <coughs> Lots of 126 point field piping right across the street. Question one, what are the problems? You're washing the trucks right now, right here. Where's that water going? In regards to there's wetlands right through here, right across the street. There's a there's a, a stormwater basin on the front of the site where the water actually runs down from the city over here. I think nothing runs in that direction. And I'll also just note for the record that this site plan has already been approved. So what tonight's application is, is a modification to add the stone crushing. So the other site plan issues of water drainage and such have already been approved and submitted, uh, submitted and approved. So this application is specifically to add the purpose of stone crushing. So that has to be, comments have to be limited to the application. Okay, uh, it goes back to also September 18th. Correct. There was also a meeting. I was never notified of that meeting back in 2018 for a screening. So Ryan would have the record of the application. So if you have a concern about what was done on the previous application, you can go to the town hall and request copies of the record for that. Okay. What are the hours of operation for crushing? Uh, they'll be from uh, nine to five during weekdays and uh, eight to noon on Saturdays, no crushing on Sundays or holidays. Well, I believe it said seven to five. Seven to five? I my apologies. Well, and that was oh, gonna process. be one of my questions. Sure. So sure. the September um, 2018 application, the proposed hours um, were Monday to Friday, seven to five, Saturday, eight to one. My question was if the stone crushing would be restricted to um, smaller operation hours. I, I certainly think that the, the commission has it within the jurisdiction if they felt as though that was necessary. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and, and so the square again, go before it. We're not looking to expand the hours of operation for this permit at all. However, you do have the ability, as, uh, as Norm indicated, to 
restrict more stringently the stone crushing itself, I suppose. Yes. And my last question is uh, noise and dust. I mean, you guys are up there crushed on November 29th, and it was dust from 9 o'clock in the morning until 4 30 at night. I mean, where does that dust come from? There is there is a well on site and uh, you know, the, uh, the the crushing itself um, uh, the the actual you know crushing operation the crushing machine does have uh, the ability uh, to add water to it to limit the dust and I, I believe that if uh, there was dust generated and obviously you know the intention of uh, the applicant uh, and the operators here are to be good neighbors and uh, they do their best to try and control the dust on the site. Uh, if there are situations where um, they, are, they are generating uh, some excessive dust and dust in its um, prohibiting activities by neighboring properties or, or if it's being troublesome to some neighbors, I, you know, they should absolutely talk to um, uh, the folks operating or, or contact the town and let them know about it. Uh, there's certainly no intention to uh, generate more dust than what's absolutely necessary. Was the water system used in November? Yes. I, I honestly couldn't, uh, couldn't say that it was the water system. No. No. Will it be in the future? What's that? Will it be in the future? Yes, we just put a 7,500 gallon tank in and uh, all. Can you just stand up and state your name for the record? Hi, Tom. This is all the applicant. We just installed right on the back side of the drill the well that they were talking about earlier with a 7,500 gallon holding tank. What the well's going to do is uh, we're anticipating using a couple thousand to three thousand gallons a day to just mist, and this is a trial and error. Um, and it's only going to be misting, just enough to keep the dust down. And the well at night will punish the tank. That's how it can go up over 10 gallons a minute. That's the design that we just did. And the only reason this, is, this whole thing has been a trial and error for a year, we learned that, which we have, you have shown the pictures of all the boulders. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, there are actually yeah. I like this show. So this was the reason for the screen change. This is all older from the site. And it's just become a nuisance to us and we had to work in this zone as they were handling to break it down and that's why the crush. So we set up a plan that just does rock. We found out putting the gravel in created dust. That's where the hiccup was in, in, in the shut right down. We had to find out that we weren't permitted right. So we're still, from November to now, we're really having the money. So um, now this plan is just designed for stone, which when you're crushing stone, you have a, a, a gritty dust that falls, and with this setup that we just created, we should, should work and handle all of it. Really should. So you have a lot more soap with the uh, gravel? With that? A lot more soap with gravel? Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a clay or a base. Which we designed this yard to use what's there and bring in good gravel. So, but fortunately, you know, this the whole thing with this is being in the business for 35 years, every job of mine, I have a bunch of rocks. So what do I do? What am I doing with these rocks? Do I need it for homeowners and then it passes it up to the neighbor when we're building the homes, we build a lot of homes. So I don't want to leave this, we bring it home and other contractors that I work for. And even being in the business just, with, uh, just for the last six months, we probably had five other little companies say, hey, I got rocks, we can take them. So that was really the creation of this yard. Um, and but I think the water problem, I feel, is very, very good with Dominic. I work with them, the pump companies. Um, it's a simple little setup. It's not going to be no big drowning of the ground. It's going to soak back into the ground. So I think it's going to be fine. I, I did witness the dust, and it was very, it was bad. Oh. But that's when we were trying the gravel and the clay, and it was just. <clears throat> so you have dust control measures yeah. put in place, prepared for. The new use. I don't want to take a few of the stone piles. I will add to that too. The, 
day that we were out there to take the sound levels, they were doing just right. And there was virtually no dusting. So this is the stone now, <coughs> not being washed at all. You see how there's no there. So you change the plant over to just crushing the stone. And the screen now is on the other plant that we're working right next to it that just take care of the same. And that's going to be the same way. So to break them both down, it makes a lot of uh, dust. So that's that stone right there. That's just like a built on stone. That's sharp from the rock that's all cut right out of that rock. Instructions it's self calibrating, but we took it out of the box, we charged it up, uh, we hit the calibration uh, button on it, and it goes through a series of, of checks and, and it calibrates itself. So it's not calibrated against any other standard or any other instruments? No, it's not. Just no, it's not. so the factory did it? Yes. And uh, do you know what the tolerance is? Like what percentage on the reading? Like is it off like by 1% or 2 or? Honestly, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, no, no, I'm asking because I feel no, like I, I, I don't because I don't know. I don't I, I don't have that answer. Right, but I'm I'm just trying to be helpful because I figured out a yeah. lot of people say, well, sure. noisy is relative, but yeah. I figured this might help to say, okay, we know it's with an X percent noisy. You, I was just curious. You can also get the same app on a smartphone. Um, gentlemen, we're not gonna have a conversation if you have your Thank comments, you. I was, you have I was to just curious. say it to the public. <coughs> so if you have another comment. All right. Well I'm I'm against it because it's noisy as all hell. But I mean, the meter that he has is the same as a smartphone. Apple has a nice free one, and you can calibrate it yourself. You can actually change the saturation level. So by changing the saturation level, you change the output. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience comment or question? Um, 
Just a point of past practice, Ryan. When we ask an applicant for a sound study, um, what are usually the parameters of that sound study? I'm not sure you ever have before. Set parameters or ask for ask for a sound study. I don't recall. Any other comments or questions from the board? Again, for the record, don't look like um, what Norm said, and I think it's important for the, for the commissioner to understand. You do not, as a as a town, have any particular noise standards. So you default to the to the Connecticut DEEP standards, and, and that's and that's where this data tracks back to. If the concern is that perhaps Mr. Depot fudge the numbers, I suppose that's a that's an interesting question, but I, but I think at least for purposes of the record, he did um, what would be appropriate engineering practice to use uh, equipment to, to measure those uh, at the boundaries, and, the, and they're well within the state limits. This is not even a close call. I don't, I don't think, think the question is that the numbers is what. I think it's just a matter of maybe an independent review of the data you obtain um, might give us a little bit more. Certainly, you have the ability to refer this matter to your consulting engineers. Mr. Gary Quality, I think, does do some independent studies as well. My suggestion would be that you might want to refer to CME to start with just to see see where they are in terms of the data provided. But that's certainly within the discretion of this commission. I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Who referred to? Mystic Sound, um, I'm sorry, Mystic Air Quality, they, they do, for example, studies with respect to um, asbestos issues of air quality in, in homes. They have. And they do, and they do, but they do, they but they, do, they, but they actually sound, do sound, do sound, 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 sound. Okay, so what I'm hearing from the commission members, and please correct me if I misunderstood. Um, but what I'm hearing is that you would prefer to leave this public hearing open in order to give the opportunity for our engineer to review the sound information that is submitted. Is that the accurate? Yeah. I believe that would be the best question. Mm -hmm. Okay. One other thing, maybe, I'm sorry, maybe uh, while this is being reviewed, give some consideration to uh, maybe uh, different hours of operation for <coughs> stone operation itself. So. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And then perhaps a more specific dust control plan to be presented. All right. So with those outstanding items, um, I'll entertain a motion to continue the public hearing. I have a motion by Roz to continue to February. I have a second from John. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, public hearing is continued to February. Thank you. And I will call the regular meeting to order. Um, we do have an addition to the agenda under new business.
Um, so to be added, item C, and what was the, um, it is C-2020-1701 of Sandy P. Inc. for our preservation, processing, and removal at 0 Millbrook Road, 7910, block 17, block 5. And was that site plan review or a special This is a special for our Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'll entertain a motion to add that to the agenda. I have a motion from John. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor of adding as item C and new business? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Adding. And that opens the floor to citizen participation. So this is opportunity to address the committee on anything that we haven't already addressed. All right. Thank you. Moving on to unfinished wait, old wait, business. Wait. I was just trying to be polite, uh, defer if anybody else wants to speak, but I, I did about two things. Um, one, and please don't construe this as being a comment on the prior occasion, damn real 20 door you have. The reason I asked about the noising is I was, you know, legitimately curious because... And you asked I, at the appropriate time. Right, no, 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 but I'm just, just yeah. some background. I, Paul and I used to work together. I used to be at a lab tech in a former life. And we would, we would calibrate instrumentation. We have like a standard, so we'd know this meter was good, it was calibrated independently. And it would take readings with one meter and compare it to the stuff we were calibrating uh, in-house, as it were. So we would know like, okay, this thing is off within like one or two percent. So I mean, just by reference, that's what I meant when I was talking about that. Um, so the other item I, I did come here originally to uh, present was, uh, the litigation with the town against itself. I just want to inform the board. I have filed a motion to intervene. And just so everything's not in the loop, I'd like you to take this correspondence. So I think uh, in the interest of expediting that and saving the town a lot of money, that should answer all the questions. It'll walk through it very simply. And I think those seven requests for admissions, the answer is obviously admitted. It should conclude the case. So thank you. Thank you. Any other citizen participation? All right. Unfinished old business. Z 2019-1620. Um, Peter Higgins has been continued to February. Um, item B, Z 2019-1661. Continuation of Matthew Hogan, B and H trailers and plows, requesting site plan review for grading, earthwork, paving, installation of retaining wall, looming and seating on property located at 6 Center Parkway, Plainfield Map 17, Block 11, Lots I-23 and I-24, um, Industrial Zoning District, IP Industrial Park Zoning District. Good evening, Madam Chair, Commission Members. I'm Daniel Blanchett from j &D Civil Engineers. I'm here on behalf of Matthew Hogan, the owner of BH Trailers. Uh, we had come before the commission about six months ago to discuss an expansion project as Matt's business in the industrial park. There have been a couple changes to the site plan that was approved, and so we're here before you this evening to gain uh, an additional approval for those changes. Um, just to refresh everyone's memory a little bit, uh, Matt is located on Center Parkway in the industrial park towards the end of the cul-de-sac. Uh, he owns the business that was originally built in 2011 for Connecticut Mom. Uh, now Matt's business is doing very well. He has too much inventory, not enough place to store it. So he purchased the lot to the west at the end of the cul-de-sac. This lot is about nine acres in size. Uh, however, five acres are wetlands and they're in a permanent concrete. So he has about four acres of good land left to work with. Uh, and the proposal was to clear three acres and build uh, three tiers of gravel inventory storage. Um, and then again, another part of the project was some improvements on his existing lot. Uh, the proposal was to reduce the size of an island to improve traffic flow. As Gentlemen, if you guys want to have a conversation, if you could take it outside, because the noise in this room, it's going to interfere with our applicants. So, much appreciated. Would the microphone be helpful? Or not? Your voice is I'm okay. okay. Let's try to speak loud. <laughs> yep. um, uh, yes, uh, shrink the size of an island. Again, all of Matt's clients have large trailers, uh, not what it was designed for when it was Connecticut Mob. And then also, 
add another gravel inventory storage area to the northeast corner of the lot. Um, now, I'll, so again, that was kind of what was previously proposed. This is what was uh, approved in May. I'd be happy to go over it in more detail if anyone has any questions. Uh, but basically, to run through the changes, the biggest change was on the new three-acre lot. Uh, there was significant ledge encountered, and so there's no way we could have foreseen that. So instead of having three tiers or terraces of parking, there's now two tiers, and basically the lower tier was raised up about four feet. Uh, again, to alleviate some of the ledge and uh, what, all the rock that we encountered. Uh, there is a retaining wall built on the downhill side. Uh, again, the lot's about 10, 12%, so there has to be some grading involved. Um, small loading dock, again, so that he can bring his forklifts and drop things off conveniently. Uh, another big change is Matthew realized uh, how convenient it is to have direct access to the second lot. It's more efficient for his business, and he really reduces the wear and tear and traffic on the town-owned center parkway. Instead of having to move trailers and plows back and forth on the town-owned road, uh, again, we'd like to keep a little, uh, again, not for clients or paying customers, but for his own internal use to be able to move things back and forth quickly. Uh, so those are kind of the big changes to that lower lot. Uh, going to his existing lot that's developed, the big change is that uh, Matthew and his contractors decided to completely remove this island. Uh, again, they feel that for his clients, it's safer. There's fewer obstacles to hit. You don't have people backing up over curbs and so forth. Um, so that was one change. The other big change is his contractor decided to use reclaimed asphalt on this storage area, our original proposal was to have everything be gravel. Again, we're not making almost any impervious area. It reduces the need for any formal stormwater systems or drainage systems. Um, Matt's contractor, Matt being Matt can explain why, they decided to use reclaimed asphalt here. Uh, and that caused some issues. The contractor maybe didn't scale correctly off my plan. And he did encroach by about six or eight feet on the scope text property. Uh, so there's a little bit of pavement onto the neighbor's property that will be cut off and removed. Um, again, the use of this per impervious surface also created some runoff and drainage issues to the pocket of wetlands, um, which again, and that has been alleviated with some drainage structures. We got second approval from the Wetlands Commission last month. They didn't have any issues. Um, <coughs> that's pretty much it. I'll open it up to questions. So what is the remediation plan um, to correct the overclearing and the encroachment on the other property? I'm not aware of any overclearing along that road. So, I mean, there basically was, I think, one dead tree and some underbrush there. There wasn't much existing. You know, once we cleared off this area, there was kind of a natural hole there. And so Matthew's already planted a couple rows of conifers. <coughs> so which, planting conifers. Yes, which has already been done. Um, and then again, going on to the remediation. Couple issues. Again, the, the part of the storage area was paved and created some erosion of the soil into the wetlands. Then we tried to fix that by making a plunge pool using some riprap to slow down that water. Unfortunately, we went a little bit too far. The contractor placed some riprap within the wetlands. So there were about 62 square feet of wetlands that were inadvertently disturbed. Um, basically, the work that was done was hand placing of small stones. And so we've now gotten approval to take those stones out by hand without using any major equipment. I don't believe there'll be any permanent damage done to the wetlands. Uh, and again, we have. Uh, where are we? Here we 
here we go. A couple notes on our plan, again, about the goals of that and how to accomplish it. Did I hear you say the uh, curbing and island was completely removed? That's correct, yep. So what's the plan to restore to the original site plan that was removed? Or is there a plan to I, restore Yeah, it? I don't believe there is a plan. I think, um, for Matt's use, again, uh, this was not designed for a lot of large trailers <coughs> to be brought in for repairs and work. <coughs> Uh, the traffic flow you know, wasn't really set up for large trucks, and Matt feels that with his clients, the best solution was to completely remove the island. And by removing the island, it gives the customer the ability to pull in with the truck and trailer. Built of the improvements and clearing limits is required prior to the CO. 
The approved plans shall be printed to Mylar and filed in the town clerk's office after being signed by the commission chair. Once the improvements to Lot 24 have been completed, <coughs> all trailers and in inventory will be removed from areas not approved for inventory storage. So could you point out exactly where the island was that was completely removed with no plan to restore? If you go back, maybe this will be a little bit clearer. Again, the original plan that was proposed, sorry, um, this whole thing was an island. The original proposal was to cut out what's in orange so that there'd be two pieces on the side. The original plan was to cut out the middle strip of it and leave a piece here to define the parking. And then this island here has what do you call them? Racks, or racks of plows, basically. So he's aware he's putting, according to Ryan's specifications, he's putting that island back in. Oh, well, that was my suggestion. It's a suggestion that the, the board can consider. Well, right. <coughs> <coughs> That's what the conditions were. If you just right. That was suggested. That's for you to decide if you want that or not. Right. I had not, I had not talked to the applicant to <coughs> find out what his reasoning was for moving that. So you heard it tonight. So it was to allow for trailer movement. Yeah, it sounds like that is, for all intents and purposes, using some trailers to provide some traffic flow and protect those lights. But again, giving himself the option, if he needs it, of pulling them out and driving all the way <coughs> And it's in my, point, my point to you is, if we approve it with these conditions, this island's got to back in. I think we prefer to not have that condition be part of your approval. Matt's preference is, is to leave the whole thing removed. Ryan, is there any ascension function to that item? Just to protect the cars that's in there in the light bulb and provide some order to the market. Is that your discretion if you want to? Uh, <coughs> I don't think Matt would do anything that would endanger his clients or. We're essentially using it more because we build trucks. We're using this area to, to store a lot of these trucks. As much as it's parking, we never really we don't use these parking spots for parking vehicles here now. We can make that a much wider opening for less congestion. Is that like a fire? I don't think so. It could be removed. Yeah. Would that eliminate the need for the staff's idea of that island? Uh, it would help, but really, I mean, this is a private site, so if the light bulb is taken down. We have to replace it or, or not. <laughs> so we, we don't so it's not it. essential. Right. Okay. All right, so given that discussion, I'll entertain a motion. Um, there are suggested conditions of approval. You can pick some, all, or none. Um, so it's up to the commission and the person making the motion what they'd like to include in their motion. Yeah. 